find your way in your Bible to Deuteronomy chapter 7. Deuteronomy chapter 7, if you have something to take notes on, the title of my message today is Too Small to Fail. And as you find your way to Deuteronomy 7, uh, let me just really quickly tell you we're so excited. We have added to the lineup for our movement conference 2023 the one and only Christine Kane. Christine Kane's joining us for the movement conference. She is unbelievable, the gift on her life. And we're just so excited she'll be a part of it as well. So if you're keeping track, August 3rd through the 6th, Big Fork, Montana, we got quite a crew who's going to be leading the way all across the conference. Torin and Robert and Louie and Andy and Chris and our Fresh Life worship team. And it's just going to be unreal. So if you or someone you know is from the ages of 6th grade through 12th grade, I'm telling you, Big Fork, Montana is the place to be this summer, August 3rd through the 6th. It's going to be incredible. And we have family groups who are putting their own groups together with teenagers in their life and their friends, as well as youth groups from across the country that are going to be making their way here. Some will be camping. Some will be staying at a hotel, motel, holiday inn. And there's no judgment, however you roll for it. But Get registered, get your group, and God's going to be doing something. And we all are going to be so excited to be making the way for that to happen. Amen? Excited to be serving. It's going to be so great. Well, we're in a series of messages called You in Five Years. And within this collection, we're asking ourselves the question, how can we be great by 2028? And we are defining great as tapping into and walking out God's plan for our lives. And we're not just going to try and bust it out for a year and have it be some New Year's resolution. We're, we're aiming for a longer change than that. The kind of change that we want to see happen in our lives isn't going to happen really quickly. Uh, but if we keep at it slow and steady, we can, I believe, by 2028, see a massive change take place in our lives, in our bodies, in our minds, in our hearts, and in our spirits. And in Deuteronomy chapter 7, we see the the perspective that I think we need to have in mind, uh, which is little by little, little by little. There's a Chinese proverb that says that a journey of 1,000 miles begins with a single step. I love that, because you you take something so overwhelming, 1,000 miles, but shrink it down. How does a 1,000-mile journey start? It starts with a single step. We've been for 16 years now uh, seeking to to build a church where people can come to know Jesus Christ, where we focus on doing things that no one's doing to reach people that no one's reaching. And we're seeing this dream of people in this region and beyond uh, come to know Jesus. And all throughout the journey, at every step of the way, whenever we feel overwhelmed, we've always reminded ourselves of this idea, 1,000-mile journey is a single step repeated over and over again. Or to put it another way, how do you eat an elephant? You shouldn't. They're endangered. It's, it, you'll go to prison. But it's encouraging to think about. You don't, don't, don't be overwhelmed by what you can't do. Do what you can do. Focus on the next thing you, do, you can do and do that and again and again and again. But that also is a word of warning. If it's true that a journey of 1,000 miles begins with a single step, that's a double-edged sword. Why? Because if you take that single step and repeat it for 1,000 miles, by the time you look up, you're going to be 2,000 miles away from where you want to go. And so that's kind of a a wake-up call that time doesn't change you. It makes you more of whatever you're heading in, of what are you're already doing. So we can't just blindly hope for a better tomorrow unless we're willing to take the small steps in the right direction, which is why the Bible so often says, consider your ways. Consider your ways. And it says, God's ways are not our ways. We have to consider our ways. Am I taking that one step, and then another step, and then another step in the right direction? Is it going, if I continue on this trajectory, is it going to take me where I want to go, where God wants me to go? All right, so with that, with that in mind, and within our hearts, this idea ringing that little things added up over time in the right direction will lead me to where God wants me to go. I can trust that process. 
and not be in a hurry to see quick results, let's look now at Deuteronomy 7. And we'll jump in at verse 17. And then I'll explain what it is that we are reading. If you should say in your heart, these nations are greater than I, how can I dispossess them? You shall not be afraid of them. But you shall remember well what the Lord your God did to Pharaoh and to all Egypt, the great trials which your eyes saw, the signs and the wonders, the mighty hand and the outstretched arm by which the Lord your God brought you out. So shall the Lord God, your God, Lord your God, do to all the peoples of whom you are afraid. What an encouraging verse. Now, of course, context-wise, the children of Israel sit poised to go into the Promised Land. That's the point. We've been talking about that some during this series. They had come out of Egypt, but had not entered into the Promised Land. And as such, they provide for us a wonderful object lesson of what it is to be in Christ. To be in Christ is to have come out of Egypt. What does that mean? You're no longer, you no longer belong to the world. The book of 1 John says the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. So the enemy has claim to anybody who is a sinner, who is currently in their sins. You're either in sin or you're in Christ. And Christ hung on the cross, becoming sin for us, so that we could choose to believe in him. And if anyone believes in him, we will be forgiven of that sin. And that sin that was placed on Jesus can't be on us anymore. And we then go inside Christ. And if you're in Christ, you're a brand new creation. All old things have passed away. What a wonderful thing. And, and how do you do that? You don't do that. He does that. That's why he said, how'd you get out of Egypt? Was Egypt is this picture of, of the old life of slavery to the enemy, this picture of, of, of a life just where you're dead in sins. You don't get out of that. He does that. That's why he says, remember what God did to Pharaoh, how God got you out of Egypt. Really, You made the process harder than it needed to be, actually. You were complaining and wondering, and I don't know. God did it. With his outstretched arm, how do you get here if you're a Christian? God did it. And he made the devil pay for it. Right? He, he with his outstretched arm. He, he brought you out. It was with his sacrifice. It was with his death. It was with the blood of the Lamb of God over your life. You were able to come out of Egypt. The death angel could not touch you. You passed through the valley of the shadow of death. How do you get out of Egypt? God did it with his outstretched arm. Remember, so now you're afraid to enter in. Well, what's, what's this entering in? Well, just because you've come out of Egypt doesn't mean you've entered into the promised land. You see, there's, there's this whole thing in the middle called the wilderness. And the children of Israel wandered around in the wilderness when God wanted them to enter into the promised land. And so the book of Ephesians tells us that we have to enter into the inheritance that was opened up to us when we came out of living in Egypt. Put it another way. A lot of people sort of think coming to know Jesus is like a box you check. OK, well, I'm saved now, so we'll just see you in heaven. <laughs> If the, if the only point of your salvation was you going to heaven, he could have just killed you the day you got saved or given you your own personal rapture. right? There's a lot of wasted time in there. Newsflash, he didn't save you just so you wouldn't go to hell. Y'all, he wants you to shake the very gates of hell. He wants you to be a part of his kingdom coming, his will being done on earth as it is in heaven. There's a plan for your life. It's not just, I'm out of Egypt. Well, that's awesome. Right on. What now? Right? He didn't just save you from something. He saved you for something and to something. There's a call on your life. There's a plan that he has for you. Every day, you can put your feet on the floor, wake up, and thank God that there's an adventure waiting you where God wants to lead you and use you, speak to you, and stretch you, touch other people through you. There is God literally does love you, and he really does have a wonderful plan for your life. But you can't just come out. You have to also enter in to lay hold of those promises. And so the children of Israel knew it was a fight coming out, and they knew it was going to be a fight going in. 
Because just as getting across the Red Sea was hard and scary and difficult and took faith, right? And how did it all happen? God told Moses to raise up his staff, to raise his arms with his staff in the air. And if you looked at the silhouette, it would have looked like the cross. So they got through the Red Sea, which is a picture of baptism because of this idea of God's miraculous power, his outstretched arm, which Moses was tapping into. So the water's parted. Now they're baptized and saved. But, but they have to enter in. So it's going to be getting across the Jordan River. And again, it would take faith. The priest would have to walk out into the water. And when their feet touched the water, then the waters would dry up. Then the children of Israel could pass on dry land. And they could go into this land flowing with Milk and honey, a table, goodness, a meal, right? God prepares a table before us in the presence of our enemies. And that's what freaked out the Israelites, because there's good eating, so all the tables are occupied, right? If you walk into a restaurant 7 o'clock on Friday and it's empty, bad sign for the restaurateur, right? You, you want a lot of covers. You want, you want tr- flipping tables. You want, it, you want, you want d- the demand. You want the buzz. Well, the, the children of Israel are going into a place crowded with giants, crowded with lots of people. Why? There's a lot of people that wanted that milk and honey. And so they were freaked out. That's the pep talk God gave them. You're scared to go in because of all these people who currently live in the land who I've already told you I'm going to drive them all out. I promised that to Abraham before you, he even left Israel, the land of Canaan. So, so how are you going to uh, approach this? You're going to do so trusting me. You're going to do so trusting my outstretched arm. And whenever you get scared, remember what I did to Pharaoh. Oh, I wish I had a church who could remember what God did to Pharaoh next time you came up against a hardship or a difficulty or, or this, is, this isn't going good, this, this situation at work, and oh, this, this tax bill unexpected, or this thing over here. If you would just in your heart go, remember what God did to Pharaoh? What am I saying? I'm saying, remember the empty tomb? Remember what God did to the devil when he had you? Remember how he thought he won when Jesus was nailed to the cross? But Jesus was saying, 1, 1,000, 2, 1,000. Come on, he came up out of that grave. So, so if you remember what he did to Pharaoh, you're not going to stress as you seek to lay claim to what is yours in Christ, potentially, if you're willing to take him at his word and lay hold of the promises of God, working out what he worked in. When you were saved, he crammed all of eternity, all of heaven, all of your calling, all of those gifts in your heart, potentially. But that doesn't become real in your life until you appropriate the promises of God, taking him at his word. And how in the world are you going to do that? You're going to do so one fight at a time. Picking up Deuteronomy 7. In verse 21, you shall not be terrified of them. For the Lord your God, the great and awesome God, is among you. I'm good then. (laughs) That's great news. You are not alone. The Lord is with you. And the Lord your God will drive out those nations before you. Little by little. Um, uh, that's that's, that's got to be a mistake. The big, huge cosmic power. Eeny, peeny, living space. Wait, wait, no, hold, wait, little by God's flexing on everybody. But he's like, I'm going to do so little by little. Like the, the massive biceps, but he's got the tweezers in his hand. I don't like it. I don't like it. I don't like it one bit. Wait, what do you mean? You're going you're gonna to take the promised land. Little by little. That's unexpected. You will be unable to destroy them at once, lest the beasts of the field become too numerous for you. But the Lord your God will deliver them over to you and will inflict defeat upon them until they are destroyed. So God is going to, if you are willing to trust the process, cause you to take hold of, lay claim to everything that's yours in Christ. But he's going to do so little by little. That's why you, your strategy, my strategy, moving towards 2028 and beyond, needs to be little by little. It needs to be too small to fail. Now, there would be seven different major campaigns, seven major battles. Most famously, we think about Jericho. 
But if you read the book of Joshua, and you will, as we continue in our journey of the Bible in this year chronologically as a church community, uh, we will see there were seven major campaigns, but then the mop-up operation after the fact. And it would not be boom, done. It would not be one quick thing. It would not be immediately, we're in the promised land, uh, you know, control, alt, delete, right? And here we go, save the princess, save the world, or whatever, right? It's not how it would go. It would take almost seven years just for the major battles. And then there would be the continued mop-up operation, little areas, little areas, little areas. But sadly, even as they would do as good of a job as they did, we, as we read the borders of the promised land God spelled out to Abraham, the children of Israel never actually took the entirety of what they could have had. Even under the height of David and Solomon's reign, there were still parts of the promised land they didn't tap into. And so we need to see the wisdom of what God was saying here. Because as you guys come surging in, you have to be able to chew whatever you bite off. And it would be easy to write checks with your mouth that your body can't cash, right? As, uh, as, as they say in, in the streets. Um, so so what, <laughs> what God's saying here is so profound and powerful to apply, because he's saying, if you win the city, but then you can't occupy the city because you got to go on to the next city. It's like anybody who has swept the board playing the board game Risk, but you didn't have the armies to maintain what you obtained. And you can't continue. And so it will become like The Walking Dead. right? It will become this ghost town if you don't have a, a constant human presence to occupy what you've taken. So don't take off more than you can actually chew, which is so powerful when it comes to life change. Let me illustrate this for you. I have a friend who was telling me a story about how uh, one day he was talking to his buddies, and they were all like, what are you doing? They were like, we're going to run a half marathon tomorrow. And he's like, oh, that sounds awesome. I should do that with you. And they're like, no, no, you, you haven't trained for a half marathon. We've been training for a while. We've been working our way up to this. We've been doing this plan. We're, he's like, no, I'm, I'm pretty fit. Let's just see how it goes. And so he did. He put a bib on, and he finished the half marathon that day, literally, and, and was, was successful in it. He was telling me this whole story. And I said, that's awesome. I didn't even know you liked to run. Do you want to run tomorrow morning? I was thinking about doing just a quick run before this conference we were going to be speaking at in Fort Worth, Texas uh, tomorrow morning. And he goes, I can't. My foot hurts. And I go, what, what's wrong with your foot? He goes, I don't know. It's been hurting for a while. I said, when did it start? He goes, right after that half marathon. Um, <laughs> you see, the point is, you need to work your way up to these things. And what I want to caution you against is the kind of like 75 hard intensity that's not sustainable when it comes to us growing into our maturity in Christ. Now, the reason we don't like that and the reason the children of Israel probably were like, what, when God was telling them all of this in Deuteronomy 7 and in Exodus chapter 23, which is a parallel passage, uh, which you're like, wait, why would it be in two places? Well, that's because the book Deuteronomy literally means second law or second giving of the law. He gave the first law to them in Exodus, and he knew they weren't paying attention, so he gave it to them twice, right? <laughs> Which tells you nothing much has changed. And, and so here we sit, and we're like, wait, I don't want it to be like little by little. I, I want it to be big and dramatic. I want it to be huge life change. I want it to be so I can do the, the before after on Instagram, how it started, how it's going. I want the, I want the yeah. And he said, if you, if you did that, first of all, your foot would hurt. And second of all, you would kind of take credit for that. But to day in and day out, keep trusting me. Keep giving it your all. One city, one hill, one mountain, one giant. What's going to happen? You're going to have to continue to trust in God's power, which is why when we pray the Lord's Prayer, we're told to pray, God, give us this day our weekly bread. No, that's not, that's not how it goes. Give us our, we would love it if it was our yearly bread. Beep, beep, beep. What's that? Bread delivery for the year, right? But why doesn't God give you, provide for you in that way? He would never hear from you again, right? So it's not like he has a supply problem. He's like, I'm oh, sorry, there's only so much bread to go around. Chill out down there. No, it's that he enjoys the demand, not that he's got a problem with his supply. He wants you to daily seek him, daily trust him. He wants your relationship with him to be this long obedience in the same direction, where you continue to show up little by, help me if you know, by little, where your plan isn't too big to succeed, but it's too small to fail. And uh, an abundance of literature on the subject of, of human improvement and change and habit formation points to the same thing. 
One of the books that I read in preparation for this message was a book by Stephen Guise called Mini Habits, uh, where I first came across the the phrase, too small to fail. He says, many people's uh, aspirations to change uh, don't come to pass, not because they're not big enough, but because they're too big. He says, your uh, actual plan in a troublesome area should be stupidly small, stupidly small, to where you would almost be embarrassed if the microphone was going around the room to say what it was, right? Stupidly small. He says, if you're tremendously out of shape and it's this big daunting thing and you've tried and failed before, don't say, I'm going to do 100 push-ups a day, bro, right? Because that sounds sexy. It sounds awesome. But day three, you're going to look like a Tyrannosaurus Rex. All right? You're gonna, what's wrong with you? Oh, my rotator cuff's killing me. Right? It's like, I, I did 100 push ups. And you're going to, you can't do that. It's not sustainable. He says, instead, it won't be this big flex, but say, I'm going to do one push up a day. Stupidly small. Why? Because it, if you made a goal to do one push up a day, you would do it just because it would be absurd to not do it at that point. There's no barrier there. And you would think, like, wait, that's ridiculous to not do it. So you'd get down into push-up position for your one push-up a day. And he would say, don't just say you're going to do it, but say exactly when. Before I brush my teeth, the moment I get out of bed, whatever, 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 after I take a leak. Like, when you make your plan, this is between you and God, right? But this is when I'm going to do my one push-up. And he says, chances are, after your one successful push-up, you're going to go, huh, that was easy, stupidly easy. And while I'm here, I might as well, I don't have to, because I've already completed my goal for the day, but I might as well get a little extra credit and bang out two or three or however many more. The point is, you're making it a very low bar at the beginning. Now, if this feels pedantic to you, then you're probably thinking about an area that's not a struggle for you. So I would encourage you to think of an area that is. And whatever that is, dial it back. Make it easier. Make a lower bar. My whole sermon in a sentence is that victory is not going to be one big battle, and now you're undefeated. It's going to be tiny things constantly repeated. That's strength. That's where we want to get to. Shrink the change that you want. Dial it back to its lowest common denominator so that it's not unsustainable. In the book, he says, don't make it your goal even of flossing every day. Just say, I'm going to floss one tooth. I like that. I'm going to floss one tooth. It's this molar right back there, right? And after you floss that one, you know what? Go crazy if you want to, but it's all you technically on paper had to do. Don't read, he says, a whole book a week. Make the commitment, I'm going to read one page per day, two pages per day if you're feeling frisky, right? Because what's going to happen? You're going to finish your two pages and go, huh, that was easy. And all of us have felt that, like, I should read, but if I don't read, like, 12 chapters, right, it doesn't count for anything. The whole Iliad and Odyssey this day before I go to sleep, like, chill out. If you read two pages, here's the sneaky part. You're going to come against a sentence. that Half the sentence is on page two. Half the sentence is on page three. And you're going to feel like, I got to. I know I shouldn't, but I'm naughty by nature, right? And (laughs) you end up reading a third page. It's the same idea in James Clear's multi-million dollar bestseller, Atomic Habits, where he uses the language of the two-minute rule. If there's a difficult habit you're having a hard time finding traction in, boil it down to anything that you can do in towards that habit in under two minutes. So it might not be a full yoga class. It might just be rolling out your yoga mat. <laughs> All right, you did, you did your work. You, and maybe that's where it starts. He talks about a guy in the book who, over a course of a period of years, lost 100 pounds, who had a rule for a while that he wasn't allowed five minutes, anything more than five minutes in the gym. So he would drive all the way to the gym, set a five-minute timer, and after he went off, he's like, I'm out of here, right? And sometimes that was just a water fountain and a burpee, right? But he did it. And eventually, it started to get a little bit easier. But his rule was, I have to do at least five minutes. And James Clear writes in the book, and I sort of aggregated a couple thoughts together I like from several sections. People often think it's weird to get hyped about reading a page or meditating for one minute or making just one sales call. But the point is to master the habit of showing up. That's life changing. A habit must be established before it can be improved. You have to standardize before you can optimize. The secret is to always stay below the point 
where it feels like work. So of course, we're not, the goal isn't to floss a singular tooth, right? But if you can anchor the habit at the same time, at the same place every day, you're doing the one thing, and it doesn't feel like work, and you know, I don't have to do any more, then of course, you can optimize it. But you can't optimize what hasn't been standardized, and you have to master the art of showing up. And over the course of, of the years of this church, spiritually speaking, we've seen people come in, get a great zeal for God, and almost like sign up for everything, and I'm going to do everything, and there's not a team big enough to hold me, pastor. So tell me, let me loose. What can I do to change the world? And it's like, easy tiger, or we won't see you in three months, right? But, but much better, the slow and the steady. Just show up, just show up, just keep swimming Nemo, and then more plates, and then more growth. But there's almost this like zeal that almost makes you disdain everyone who doesn't love God as much as you do, and no one's ever loved, ever loved the Lord or wanted purity and fidelity in the preaching of his word like you have. And we are watching and waiting for the sound of screeching tires and impact and the thud that is invariably going to follow, because that's how the Pharisees ended up where they did. This big zeal, but not according to wisdom. Because what is God after? That slow and steady. Let it keep it cool. Let there be a relationship. That's why the first disciples to follow Jesus said, where are you staying, master? And he goes, come and see. The point is, just walk with me. Just, you'll find out as we get there. It, we're not after some big, pretentious show. How long can you pray? How much from the original Greek do you know? <laughs> <laughs> Any spirituality that could give you hemorrhoids is not according to God's plan for your life. All right? That's why he used so many agricultural analogies. You, you're like, what do you, you want to grow with Jesus? He said, hey, see those? See those uh, grapes over there? It's like a Cabernet vine. Do they seem like they're working real hard? Right? Like trying to pop out some grapes? It's like, no, they're just, they're just have you been in Napa? They just hang, man. This is the most, pe- it's, just, it's just pound for pound, most peaceful place I've been to on planet Earth. Because they're just a bunch of drunk humans and chilling vines, right? <laughs> just. And Jesus straight up said, I am the vine. Y'all are the branches. Just chill with me. Just roll with me. What's going to happen? You're going to grow fruit, unless you don't just go, well, I'm taking my vine somewhere else, right? Like, just, I'm going to jump over to the other vine over here, where they'll, 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 they'll tickle my ears and tell me what I want to hear and tell me I'm a wonderful snowflake, right? And just chill, baby girl. Just roll with me. You'll grow grapes if you don't lose heart. Is this helping anybody? I'm just, I'm just preaching for myself. And if anybody else is blessed, that's great. I'm going to show this to you all across the scripture. Let's just take a quick tour. Zechariah 4.10, who dares despise the days of small things? Answer, everybody. <laughs> right? Your first time on the treadmill, you like huffing and puffing, and you look down. How, don't look at the calorie thing. Put your towel over the thing that tells you the calories, because you will work your butt off. And it's like 73 calories. And you're like, that's, that's half of a power bar. And I ate two to fuel up on the way to the gym. <laughs> I got a deficit for working out. Everybody despises the days of small things. Every, everybody despises that first payment to, to get out of debt. Everyone, everyone despises the early activity where you don't see any difference, and it's not working, and you're tired, and you're hungry, and you want comfort food, and you want to go buy something. Everybody despises the days of small things. Everybody wishes Jesus offered prime delivery on sanctification. where I could track it all the way to my freaking mailbox, you know, where we, we could just watch the growth happen, where I could just grow with God and be a man of God. I just want my, to be a good husband. I just want to be a good dad. I just want to stop struggling with these things that I've already repented from like 15 times. How, how, how does it happen? Come on, what do I got to do? Where do I, is there a retreat I got to go to? I got to climb, climb to the top of a hill and carry a giant cross up there? Will that do it, right? It's like, it, what, how many pine cones do I got to burn at the fire of my summer camp in my youth to, to not struggle with lust anymore? All of these things. Let me tell you, you just got to keep walking with them. Everybody despises the days of small things. So they walk away thinking it wasn't working. And they want some quick fix that they can buy. But you got to just keep doing the small things. And little by little, you'll take the whole land. We find the same thing in Job 8, verse 7. And though you started with little, you will end with much. 
the entirety of Scripture teaches if you can be faithful with small things, God can trust you with more. But many people won't be because they despise the small things. In fact, all of Jesus' kingdom uh, can be summarized in this way. It's like a mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field, which indeed is the least of all the seeds. But when it is grown, it is greater than the herbs and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and nest in its branches. And apparently, there's no plant that so disproportionately grows in size compared to the size it starts out, that a mustard seed is so insignificant but can become the largest of the garden plants. And so that's God's heart for you. So what do we need to do? I'm going to give you five things that can be set into motion as you seek to take the good land of the growth in Christ that he put into you when he, when he brought you out of Egypt. And you are going to walk in little by little. First of all, choose carefully. Choose carefully. Uh, don't pick battles willy-nilly or arbitrarily, because not all change that happens in our lives is created equal. That is to say, researchers have found that there are so-called keystone habits that if you choose wisely, you sort of get two for the price of one or more. And the definitive research on this topic is by Charles Duhigg in the book, The Power of Habit, where he gives the science behind what's called habit coupling, or others have called it habit stacking. Uh, in an arch of stones, there is a certain co- stone called a keystone. And you can handle pulling some stones out, but if you find out and identify what the keystone is, you're going to know it because the whole situation is going to jenga on top of you. Okay, So there's a keystone. It's a stone that holds other stones together. And when it comes to habits, and all habits have keystones, uh, there are, in fact, principles where you can boil them down to certain habits where if you pull that stone out, it's going to positively, positively impact other habits as well. Uh, what would these be like? Uh, he gives in the book the examples of making your bed. It feels like a relatively small thing to do, a benign thing to do, right? So easy that you're like, oh, it's, easily, it's easily despised or dismissed. But in studies, it's been found if you make your bed as the first thing you do in the morning, you're beginning your day with momentum. You're beginning your day with a sense of, I accomplished something. And they go on to track people who make their bed versus don't make their bed. And you are less likely to spend on your credit card on a day where you've made your bed. That came out of left field. (laughs) Keystone habit. You pull that one out, other things start to go. It just sort of uh, is a trend. It's sort of a groove for the day. It sort of says to yourself, here's how I'm taking this day on. I'm just going to choose to to, to arrange and to, to see things clean. And look, you're like, Levi, I need a verse for this. Hey. When the disciples came into the empty tomb, Jesus' grave clothes were folded. (laughs) Which is, to me, about the most punk rock verse in the entire Bible, Okay, You picture Jesus like, I just overcame the grave. Ah, Like he's exhausted. Like, so many untie my boxing gloves. Ah." You know? It's like, no, he's just calmly folding his, his, his linen, linen cloth. He, I mean, goodness gracious. This is a guy who's just do, 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 three, two. <laughs> awesome, right? That's how we can begin our day as well. Keystone habits. Exercise is a keystone habit. Food journaling has been found to be a keystone habit. A little flashback from a previous collection. Family dinners are a keystone habit. You want to work on your kids not becoming obese, and your kids not getting into gangs, and your kids not, right, all the, teen pregnancy, all these like, well, how about if we just sat down and had a meal together uh, five times a week? It's like boom, boom, bing, bang, bong, right? All these little things. It's a keystone habit. They cascade. And part of it is because of something that is called a sunk cost fallacy. So if you're working out and doing all that work to work out, part of it psychologically is, I want to go find a smoothie and not just go wolf down a Whopper because I've already invested so much energy, I don't want to ruin it. It's sort of that mental thing where you're just going to sort of be pulled along in that slipstream. I believe with all my heart, tithing to be a keystone habit where you choose to say, hey, and I I love this. Here's God, here's the, the first and the best of what you've given to me. You gave me this. You gave me this inheritance. You gave me this bonus. You gave me this unexpected revenue. You gave me this salary. First and the best back to you, 10% to you. Why? Because where my treasure is, my heart is. 
There's this little app for kids. I don't know if you've seen the commercials for it. It's called Greenlight. We've gotten all into it, right? Where you can pay your kids for work they do on the Greenlight, and they have an ATM card. But you can say ahead of time where that ATM card will work or not work, what they can do with it or not do with it. But the coolest feature of it to me is they can also take some of that money, and they can give it right there within their Greenlight to their church, to a nonprofit. But then they can also invest a little bit of it. And so I got Lennox literally like, hey, I want to buy a little more Mattel, because he likes the Hot Wheels. And then Mattel has not been performing well, right? And, 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 and then they, they buy Nike, and they buy Disney. They're buying stocks, right? And we, we have this conversation all the time. Do you want to buy something from Amazon, or do you want to own a little bit more of Amazon, right? And, and so this idea of being the head and not the tail, you can ingrain at very, very, very young ages. And the beautiful thing about it is we've noticed is they want to check on how their investments are doing. And that's because where your resource goes, your attention naturally follows. So a lot of us are saying, I want to have a greater heart for God and a simple way to just sort of hack the system and care more about God. I'm telling you, I stand there hearing about the report of the church that we built in Israel because God said, those who bless the Jews, I will bless. Those who curse them, I will curse. And I'm going, hey, that's part of my investment. I'm sitting there like I'm looking at the stock on Amazon, which has been doing very badly, right? But kingdom stock. This is ownership we get to keep forever. Moths and rust can't destroy. Thieves can't break in and steal. It's a keystone habit. So choose carefully. You might get two for the price of one. All right, secondly, spell it out specifically. As we formalize some of these things that God wants us, our our battle strategy, what is our little by little we're taking on this week? Not worrying about the next battle, but this is the one in front of us here today. We're going to spell it out specifically. To speak like an attorney, we want to use bright lines, not fuzzy lines. When writing a contract, you want to make sure lines are, 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 are bright, not fuzzy, to where there's not ambiguity, so that you have crisp uh, accountability in the contract that you created. So you're not going to say something that ends in er. I just want to be healthy er this year, right? I just want to eat better, right? Because it's like, what does that even mean? And how will you know when you got there, right? I'm going on a road trip. Where are you going? Somewhere. <laughs> no. You know what I'm saying? Like Cardi B planned uh, the itinerary or something. You need, to, you need to actually, some of you ask your children what that meant later. Um, you need to know. There needs to be accountability. So, so, so bright lines. So it's not, for example, uh, I'm, am I going to eat better? It's like I'm not going to eat Doritos at all. That might be your thing. So I'm like, oh. Doritos, right? So, so we'll know if your fingers are orange, <laughs> if, if, if you've been fudging. Like, like, like there's, there's clear, crisp, uh, spelled out specifically. It's not, I'm going to be on my phone less while I'm driving, or I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to not text while driving even, right? That's still fuzzy language. And how crazy is it these days? Driving around, just everyone's just on their, on their phones while driving, right? And, if, and of course, if we all think about it, what would we want people around our kids to do while they're driving down the road? And we should do that ourselves as well. So we would not want to just put fuzzy language, like I'm not going to text while driving, because there are 4 billion things you can do on your phone that aren't texting. Well, I wasn't texting. I was actually looking up a recipe for dinner. It's like, that's not better, you know? (laughs) So you instead might say, uh, I'm not going to touch my phone. My hands will not touch my phone while my vehicle's in drive. If it's in drive, my hands are not on my phone. You get the point. It's not, I'm not going to look at porn uh, as as, as much. (laughs) It's like, uh, maybe it's going to be, I'm not going to be on the internet without someone else in the room. If I need that accountability, it's just really hard. If there's not someone else in the room, uh, that, that, that's going to be uh, a bright line, a concrete plan. If you mean business, that's how you spell it out. Not, not, I'm not going to, I'm going to drink less next year, right? Look, we all have a drunker friend than us. Because the problem with that is then it's like, well, I'm not, as long as I don't drink as much as that pal. You could be pretty well under the table, but still in your mind, there's someone who drinks more, right? So spell it out specifically. Number three, track it diligently. Track it diligently. Why? Because if you aren't keeping score, you're only practicing. And it's really hard to motivate yourself at the level of a competitor, which we want to be competitors. Paul said, I run not just like messing around. 
I want to get the prize. Anybody with me on that? Who wants to get to heaven and found out you laid hold of what Christ Jesus laid hold of you for? Translation, you accomplished the mission. You, you fulfilled your potential. You reached his plan for you. God was scheming in heaven all about you, and you were the solution to the problem in his heart, and that you get to heaven and are able to say, I did the thing you wanted me to do. That's what Paul said. I'm not screwing around. I want to get me all that milk and all that honey. I don't want to get there and find out what you could have done had you got after it with all your heart. And if you're not keeping score, come on, please. You're just playing around. In the book, The Four Disciplines of Execution, the authors say, quote, bowling through a curtain might be fun in the beginning, but if you can't see the pins fall, it will soon become boring, even if you really love bowling. Something changes when you know there's a score. And so if you start keeping track of some of these things, it'll change. It'll gamify uh, your interest in it. So we're going to guard it aggressively. And as, as, as that goes, we're going to try and stack up as many wins as we can in a row. Because what? Little by little. Give it time to compound. Uh, Tynan, in the book Superhuman by Habit, writes, and I quote, by failing to execute, potentially you're not just losing a minor bit of progress, but rather threatening the cumulative benefits you've accrued by establishing a habit. This is a huge deal and should not be treated lightly. So make your habits relatively easy, but never miss doing them. And one recurring theme that I've found as I've read uh, what is out there with regards to the science of habit formation is this statement, never miss twice. Never miss twice. Because you and I, let's just be real, we're going to miss. There will be a day. Like, I, got conf- I get so confused when I cross the international date line flying on my Bible reading. I'm like, oh, crap, it's yesterday. What do I do now? You know what I'm saying? I get so weird. Like, am I technically, I'm on this like 20-hour flight to Dubai or Johannesburg, and there might be a day where I've misread my Bible, but it was weird, and I, don't, I blame it on physics, right? So, so should the off chance come and you miss a day, here's, here's the really big idea. Never miss twice. Never miss twice. A phrase you'll find out there is called habit suicide. Once you've missed twice, it's really hard and, and demotivating to, to continue. But if you miss and you say, hey, the righteous may fall seven times, but get back up again. I, I fell. I looked at porn. I fell. I slept with my girlfriend. I fell. I did the thing. I'm not missing twice. I'm going to get back up. I'm going to get back up. I'm going to get back up when I fall. I'm going to keep going. That's guarding it aggressively. And then lastly, and we'll close with this thought, celebrate immediately. Celebrate immediately. It doesn't feel like it's time to celebrate when you just won one tiny battle with the smallest tribe or whatever. Like after they finished defeating AI, AI was so small. After Jericho comes AI, Jericho was this big, hard battle that they fought. They had to march around it a bunch to make it fall down. They were peeing in their pants. They were so scared. But God took care of it with his really long arm. They still had to show up, but God did it. Next came AI. AI was so small compared to Jericho that they all got together and said, we're so strong. We took Jericho down. What's AI going to do? And so they said, here's what they said. They said, let's send out the JV soldiers. Let's not even send out our A game. Let's just send out the JV. And, and they did. And they got soundly whooped, which is what happens to us in life, because pride comes before a And after a big battle that we've won, we being very generous to describe our contribution to the whole thing, right? Like Lennox has a bubble mower. Let's mow the lawn, Dad. He's like, we did a great job, Dad. Yeah, we did, right? <laughs> yeah, God, we really have grown. He's like, yeah, we have really grown. You showed up. I grew the grapes. I did it through you. But God wants us to celebrate. So, he, so after they got whooped at AI, then they, with their full hearts, trusted God, and they were successful. It hardly feels like a time to celebrate, but, but God had them do that exact thing. And one of the things you'll read in your journey through the Old Testament is how often God inefficiently stops everything and makes them throw a party. See, we got stuff to do. God's like, time for a party, time for a feast. Time to look back. Time to remember what I did to Pharaoh. What, what does Pharaoh have to do with anything? Don't forget. Look, hey, you, don't forget. Hardly feels like a time to celebrate, but we're going to lift up our hands and worship the God of the empty tomb, the God of the cross, 
the God of the previous battle, because that's going to give us encouragement for the next battle. So celebrate immediately. I knocked over one teeny tiny domino, and I did my ah push-up. Just ah push-up? Yeah, just the one. Yes. Over the next five years, guys, I want you to get so good at that fist bump. Yes. You just flossed a tooth. Your mouth is swarming with gingivitis. Gums are covered in blood. It's clear you have a long way to go. I did the thing. I showed up. And I'm going to show up tomorrow. And I'm going to show up after that. And I'm going to show up after that. And I'm going to show up after that. I'm going to show up. 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 God, you bless me with money. I'm going to tithe it back to you. God, you bless me with a new week. I'm going to show up and lift my hands and praise you as the dawning of the new week. God, you give me a new day where my heart's beating. I'm going to get down on my knees, and I'm going to say, this day, I'm yours. I'm going to let your word set the pace for my life. And tomorrow, I'm going to do it again. And it's going to feel like I got so long to go and so far to go, but I'm going to continue to do it. And when I did the thing, I'm going to give myself a little, yes, did it, nailed it, showed up again. See you tomorrow. We're going to trust the process. In the book Tiny Habits by BJ Fogg, a PhD at Stanford who's been heralded as one of the foremost voices on human change, he says there's not a word in the English language for the positive feeling after you did something hard that you feel afterwards. He said, there should be some sort of word. So he decided, I'm going to make up my own. You know what he called it? Shine. Shine, he said, should be the thought that we have. We, we did the hard thing, even if it was tiny, and almost easily despised, because it was stupidly little. Little by little, but I got to take a whole country, but it's just this tiny little piece. He said, shine. Take, the shine is when you just revel for a second in the goodness of that moment, how good that felt, the victory that is there. I love that, of course, because we know that the Bible says in Psalm 23 that God anoints our head with shine. He wants you to shine. He wants you to shine. He wants your face to shine. He wants your countenance to shine. He wants to bless you and keep you, cause his face to shine upon you. He wants to show his goodness to you. He wants you to sit at a table surrounded by enemies and just to continue to advance. All of these goodness and mercy that will follow after you. So celebrate immediately. In the book, he says, look at this, celebrate tiny successes by skillfully celebrating. Wow. Let the party continue. You, you create a feeling of shine, which in turn causes your brain to encode the new habit. Because our brains are like dogs, y'all. They salivate when the bell rings and they get fed. So we, if we praise what we want to see repeated in our own selves, we're developing a positive connection to it. This one small shift in your life can have a massive impact, even when you feel there's no way up or out of your situation. Celebration can be your lifeline. I just thought about halal. I thought about how good it is to worship God in the midst of the deal, even when it feels like there's no way up. Man, this man is preaching, right? That, that we, we can celebrate. It's just God, I'm just going to show up another day. We can celebrate his goodness, his outstretched arm. It can be a lifeline. Little by little adds up. You know, we've been talking in these messages a lot about compound interest. And I've been trying my hardest to illustrate it to you. Like lying on a bed of nails, getting a sledgehammer out, hard to illustrate compound interest to you. Lie on one nail, that's called being impaled. Lie on a thousand nails, you're all right, right? Thinking about dominoes and how they grow, just a visual image of what we can grow up to in Christ. But my most favorite illustration of compound interest actually is, is the easiest to demonstrate and the safest to do. We don't have to add a new rider to our insurance policy for this one. The Guinness Book of World Records says that the most times a single sheet of paper can be folded over and over again is 12. Now, that's impressive. Because if you try with a piece of paper and fold it, I can't get past six. There's your one, there's your two, there's your three, there's your four, there's your five, there's your six. I'm telling you, that seventh fold, I don't know what witchcraft those people are doing who can get to seven. Try it on your own. If you're like, oh, you're just, you just must be weak. You skipped leg day. Oh, OK, hold on a second. 
Mr. P90, whatever. I'm telling you, it's crazy. But the Guinness Book of World Records certified 12 is the amount of, of times a single sheet of paper can be folded over and over and over again. Now, to be fair, the girl who did that used a 4,000-foot-long sheet of paper <laughs> made of tissue. And that was how she was able to do it. But she, even with all that, couldn't get past 12. Why? Because every time it folds over, it doubles. We know that, but it's a, it gets a lot thicker really quick. Now, I just did six in front of your eyes. If I was physically able to get to 26, it would be taller than Mount Everest. 42, I'd be to the moon. 51, I would pass the sun. And 103, that fold, would be 93 billion light years, the distance of the known universe. And even there, God would still be saying, yep, it's about that wide. So come on, let's use every breath we have. Some of you need to sit down and think about that for a while. But every bit of what I just said is true and verifiable and one Google search away. But don't, don't, don't be distracted by any of that, because what I'm trying to say is, how great is our God? How big is our God? How, how past finding out is our God? And if we just trust the process, there is nothing our God can't do, and he'll do it through you. I'm going to close with an encouragement. If you like open palms, open yours for this that I want to speak over you. Courage, my heart. Go on, little by little, for many littles will make a great whole. Courage, my heart. As we just close, I just want to encourage you to encourage yourself. Get better at encouraging yourself. I love that language. Courage, my heart, little by little. Courage, my heart. Many littles will make a great whole. If you're like me, you have a hard time encouraging yourself because you see all the things you want to do and grow. And it's easier to berate yourself. In this attitude of prayer, let me just confide. My family was playing tennis yesterday. And my daughter and I had had multiple matches lead up to a final match together to play. And when we were finished, my younger daughter, Clover, who was observing, came up to me and said, Dad, what did Livy do? I said, what do you mean, what did, what did Libby do? She said, I heard you speak so harshly to her during the game. I said, what did you hear me say? She said, you told her, Liv, we're going to have a stern talking to after this. What did she do? I said, babe, I said, Levi, we're going to have a stern talking. I was talking to myself. I missed a, a shot, and I was so furious. I said, in all seriousness, it just feel that Levi, we are going to have a stern talking to after this. I don't even know what I meant. It's because it's so easy to be our own worst critic, isn't it? So easy to see and be gentle with other people and their efforts to try, but our own selves, we just slam ourselves down as failures. We believe the lies that have been spoken over us. We heap more shame upon ourselves. When God wants us to gently encourage and coax ourselves to trust in God yet again, come on, if that word's for you that you need to get better at encouraging yourself, could you just raise up a hand? God bless you. God loves you. Courage hearts. Courage, dear ones. Little by little. You're doing so much better than you think you are. You're trying. You love him. You want to grow. And God wants that too. He is for you, not against you. So I just want to encourage you to speak lovingly. Speak kindly to yourself. Speak to yourself like you would talk to me if I was having a bad day. You would encourage me. You'd pray for me. So do that for yourself. God loves you so much. And even now, he's causing your face to shine. You can put your hands down. And I want to give an invitation for anybody who's here today and you've never trusted Christ for salvation. You see, what we've been talking about in this message is a process. But salvation is an event. How you come out of Egypt so that you can begin to enter into these battles and growth and all these things, it starts with an event called salvation. Here's how Jesus put it. I stand at the door and I knock. And if anyone heard anyone opens the door, I will come in. So today can be an event that enters you into the process of growing in your relationship with God. But if you're here and you've never done that, there is a great danger because life is a vapor. It's a shadow. It's going to be here and gone. We only have one opportunity to trust Jesus, and it's this life. 
before we enter into eternity. But God loves you so much. That's why he sent Jesus. And Jesus loved you so much. He was glad to come, the joy set before him of God's glory being released through your salvation. And he will come into your heart and save you and change you and make you new. But you must trust him for salvation. Unless you repent of your sins and turn to him, you will perish. And that's not what God wants for you. So I'm going to give this moment now as an invitation to urge you to trust him for salvation. And if that's you I'm describing, you, you hear and sense the Holy Spirit of God drawing you to him. That's not a mistake. The Bible says we cannot come to him unless he draws us first. So, so it's the Father's calling. It's his love you're responding to as you trust Jesus today. Every location, church online, podcast as well. If that's you I'm describing, say this with me. Church family, say it with us. Dear God, I know that I'm a sinner. I can't fix myself, but I believe you can. I invite you to come into my heart. Make it your home. Help me to follow you. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for the resurrection. Thank you for new life. I give you mine. In Jesus' name.